6.3 binomial random variables. To give an example of what a binomial random variable is, we're going to start this section with a pop quiz. The quiz consists of 10 multiple choice questions, each having five answers labeled A through E. Now you're not going to actually see the questions for these problems, you just have to randomly guess. So pick A, pick C, pick D, etc. Now this is a binomial probability problem because it meets the following four criteria. The first one is the most important to be able to recognize in that it's the number of times that a specific event occurs. So in this case, we have 10 questions. We're going to be interested in how many we get correct. That'll be called a success for this problem. The next requirement is that these trials are independent, meaning that if we get the first one correct, it doesn't change the probability of getting the next one correct. And same thing with getting it wrong. All right, it doesn't tell us anything about what's going to happen in the next problem. We need to have a fixed number of trials. In this case, there's 10 because there's 10 questions that we'll be guessing an answer on. And lastly, we have to have a probability of success that stays the same for all of our trials. So if we're just guessing from five options, our probability of success is one out of five or 0.2. Now to make those four criteria a bit easier to remember, we're gonna use the acronym BINS. If it meets all four of these requirements, it's a binomial setting, which we're gonna be able to solve in a specific way. So in BINS, the first letter being B stands for binary, and binary means that we have two outcomes, we have successes and we have failures. The I in BINS is independent. When we know what happens in one trial, it's not going to affect the probability of what happens in the following trials. N stands for number, meaning that we have a fixed number of trials. In this case, it would be 10 multiple choice questions. And the S is for same probability, meaning that the probability of our success doesn't change as we go through our trials. Now let's look a little closer at that first requirement in BINS, the B for binary. Binary means that we have two outcomes, success and fail, but it doesn't mean that we only have two options. So let's think about this pop quiz situation where we have a, uh, 10 questions. Each of those has five outcomes, or five possible answer choices, A through E. Only one of those is a success. That's, for example, guessing uh, answer A. All the other four would be labeled as failures. All right, so even though there's five options for what we choose, we have only two outcomes. We choose a successful answer, a correct answer, or we choose a failure, which would be an incorrect answer. So let's use those four criteria to identify whether a given scenario describes a binomial setting. In part A, it says genetics says that genes children receive from their parents are independent from one child to another. Each child of a particular set of parents has probability 0.25 of having type O blood. Suppose these parents have five children. Let's count up the number of children with type O blood. So is this a binomial setting? Well, we're gonna check those four criteria in bins to determine. So first off, is it binary? Okay, it is. A success would be that they have type O blood. A failure would be any blood type that's not type O. They're independent because if we know the blood type of one child, it doesn't tell us anything about uh, the blood types of the other children. N, the number, we have five children. Those are a number of trials. And same probability, that's the S, it tells us there's a 0.25 chance of having type O blood. So since these four criteria are met, this is a binomial setting. Part B, shuffle a standard deck of 52 playing cards, turn over the first 10 cards one at a time, record the number of aces that we observe. So as for the B, we do have two outcomes. Success would be getting an ace. Failure would be getting something other than an ace, but they're not independent. If we flip over a card and it's not an ace, let's say we get a queen. Now there's only 51 left. It started as four out of 52 that were aces. After we flip over that key, Queen, now it's four out of 51. These are not independent, the probability is changing, and that would also affect our last right requirement that we have the same probability. So this is not binomial. Now that we know that that first example is binomial, let's solve a few problems with it. So these parents have five children, 
Each child has a 0.25 chance of having type O blood. We want to find the probability of X equals zero, or in other words, none of these children have type O blood. Now, given that there's a 0.25 chance that they have type O blood, the probability that they don't is just the complement of that. So there's a 75% chance that they don't have type O blood. In this case, since they have five children, we're looking for five failures. So all five of our children are failures, not in life, but just in the sense that they don't have type O blood, which means we have 0.75 times itself five times, and we get 23.73%. Where it gets a little more complicated is once we move past that situation where zero children have type O blood. So let's find the probability that X equals one or that one of these five children has type O blood. Now there are a number of different ways that this can happen. For example, it could be the firstborn child where the four that come after that firstborn don't have type O blood. So in that case, our firstborn is a success and everyone after that is a failure. 0.25, that's the probability that that firstborn has type O blood. And then we have four children following that firstborn that has something other than type O. When we simplify this, we can just write it as 0.25 to the first and then 0.75 to the fourth. Now this is specifically for the first child having type O and the next four not having type O. But there's other ways that we can have one out of five children with type O blood. For example, it could be the second person, the second child. So in that case, we have the first as a failure, a successful second child, and then three failures after that. This, when we write it out, will look exactly the same as the other one. It's just that the order that, that, that's changed. And these are different situations with the same probabilities. And there are three other situations that we need to consider, and that's when child three or child four or child five are the ones that have type O blood, and all of those have the same exact probability. We have one child with type O blood, and we have four children that don't have type O blood. When we use the word or in statistics, it means add. So it could be child one or child two or child three. All of these probabilities are the same, and we're just adding those together for the number of times that they can occur, in this case, five, because there's five different children. So we can write this as five times that probability that we just found for each of those individual events, and we're gonna get 0.3955 as our answer. So when we look at this, that five out front is the number of different ways that we can get one child out of five with type O blood. Next, we have the one child that has type O blood, followed by the four children who do not. When it comes to writing out this probability, it's the five out front that's typically the most challenging to understand because most people can see where that 0.25 to the first and 0.75 to the fourth comes from. So if we throw this back to last chapter, right, that five is actually the number of combinations that we can uh, select one child from a group of five. So it's a 5C1 problem, which we covered back in chapter five, and that's multiplied by the probability of one out of five children having that type O blood. Here's our one success followed by our four fa failures. That's the same for all of the different situations, so we can just multiply it by how many situations there are. And that brings us to our binomial probability formula. So we have our combination out front, the number of items we're selecting from our group. We have our P, which is our probability of success, raised to the number of successes. That's how many we're picking. And then one minus P or Q raised to whatever's left over. If we have two successes out of five, there would be three left over. This is the equation for our combination, but we'll just use our calculator to, to find out what that is. Now this equation tends to look scary, but when we break it down, it's really not that complicated. So up front, we have the number of ways to get our successes out of n trials. That's just the combination. The order doesn't matter when we talk about one child out of five having type O blood. All right, so it's a combination instead of a permutation. Next, we have our probability of success. In this case, it would be 0.25, the probability of having type O blood, and the number of children who will have type O blood. 
Then we have the probability of failure. Typically, we'll just write this as Q instead of 1 minus P. And the number of failures is just what, whatever's left over. So if we took 3 out of 5 for the number of successes, there would be 2 left over, or N minus that 3, 5 minus 3. So let's go back to that situation that was introduced in the first slide. You're going to take a pop quiz. You don't get to see the questions. You're just randomly selecting answers on 10 questions with options A through E. You have a one in five chance of guessing correctly and a four in five chance of guessing incorrectly. What's the probability of getting four out of 10 questions correct? To solve this, we're just going to plug right into our binomial probability equation. So X is the binomial random variable. We know that there's 10 trials because there's 10 questions on this quiz. We know that the P is 1 fifth or 0.2. And the Q is going to be the complement of that, 4 fifths. We can plug in everything to this equation here. So we have 10 choose 4. We have four correct answers out of the 10 questions. It doesn't matter what order they, can, uh, they come in, so that's a combination. Here's our probability of getting a correct answer and we want four of them. And then that's followed by the probability of getting an incorrect answer. And this is however many is left over once we take four away from the 10 trials. Plug this into our calculator and we get 0.088. That's the probability that we get four questions correct out of the 10. We can use that equation to find the probabilities for each individual event. So here we have a probability distribution for all the possible outcomes of having five children and the number of those five children that would have type O blood. So for example, this probability right here came from 5C3. We're choosing three of these children to have type O blood. There's a 0.25 chance that they have type O blood. We want three with that blood type. There's a 75% chance that they have something other than that, and there's two, so that'll be raised to the second power. Now, what would this look like in a histogram? We could just plot this out, and we see that it has a skewed right distribution. All right, on the left, we have our probability. On the bottom, we have our variable. Here's two other examples of what binomial distributions can look like. They both have that same sample size as the one that we've just looked at, which was skewed to the right. So these are all sample sizes of five. This one we can see is skewed to the left. And the thing that changed is that the probability went from 0.25 to 0.8. This one is approximately normal. And in this one, the probability is 0.51. So generally, when we have a binomial distribution, if the P is close to 0.5, we'll have something that's approximately symmetric. If the P is small, if it's much less than 0.5, we're going to have something that's right skewed, like we saw in the last slide. And if we have something, uh, an example of P that's greater than 0.5, like this one here, it's going to be left skewed. And these are the cases when we have a small sample size. As the sample size gets larger, they all approach a more normal distribution. 